I'm Susan Weber, and joining Walker & Dunlop CEO Willie Walker today is Dr. Richard Tedlow. Willie and Dr. Tedlow will have an in-depth discussion on leadership, vision, and what makes our generation's greatest business minds tick. Thank you, Susan, and uh, good morning, everyone. I am uh, thrilled to have Harvard Business School Class of 1949 Professor of Business Administration Richard Tedlow with me today. Uh, Professor Tedlow is a specialist in the history of business and has written several books, including Giants of Enterprise, which was published in 2001, The Watson Dynasty on IBM in 2003, Andy Grove in 2007, and his most recent book, The Emergence of Charismatic Business Leadership in 2021. Dr. Tedlow received a BA from Yale University, along with an MA and PhD from Columbia University. I must admit at the beginning that Dr. Tedlow's class at Harvard Business School was one of the most highly desired second year elective courses at HBS when I was there. And I unfortunately didn't get into his class to be able to learn from him when I was there. But I can tell you from having read The Emergence of Charismatic Business Leadership that I would have learned a lot from him back in 1995. And I hope all of us can learn a lot from him today. And if you have not read his book, I would strongly suggest getting it. Uh, Dr. Tedlow, let's dive right in. Your, your book reviews three eras of American corporate leadership. You begin in the 1950s to 1970s with a focus on General Motors and its CEO, Harlow Curtis, in an age when corporate America's world dominance was so great that it was the company and not the CEO that was remarkable. Um, you then move into the era of 1975 to 1995, where America was in retreat, uh, but certain leaders like Lee Iacocca and um, uh, Sam Walton uh, were able to both turn around companies as well as found companies that became iconic American brands. And then you focus on the era from 1995 to present, when it is no longer the company or the market, but the charismatic individual leader such as Steve Jobs, Oprah Winfrey and Elon Musk that are defining not only their companies, but entire industries. So I guess two questions to start off. Why did you write this book? And then second, why did you feel that charisma is the defining characteristic of your protagonists? Um, well, uh, before I begin, Willie, let me just say what a pleasure it is uh, to see you and to be on the webcast. Uh, so I'm, I'm honored and it's a, a, uh, and privileged and it's nice to be able to chat with you about, about uh, my work. Um, the idea for this book uh, 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 derives from October 5th, 2011. I mean, I know the day. And the reason that it's that day is that that's the day Steve Jobs died. And I, was, I had left the Harvard Business School after 32 years in 2010. I was recruited to come out to Apple to join their internal executive education program, which is called Apple University. And uh, so, um, you know, basically a year after I got there, Steve passed away and we were overwhelmed by condolence messages. I had never seen anything like this. I mean, millions of messages, um, micro blogging sites all over the world, in places like China. Uh, there were millions of them telling people that the man's uh, died. Um, uh, there, were message, there were condolence messages from all over the world. If you, if you or any of your viewers remember that day, walking past an Apple store, there were all kinds of post-its that the store managers put on the, uh, the glass uh, uh, walls of the, um, uh, of the store, and, and people bought bouquets of flowers. I mean, somebody went out and bought a bouquet of flower, flowers, lots of people did, and put them at, on, in the stores, just gave them away. And uh, it struck me, um, being an historian and having read books about funerals of CEOs going all the way back to the uh, early eight, 19th century in the United States, that nothing like this had ever happened before. Uh, this had just never happened before. So history is the story of change over time. This clearly represented a change. And, and it stuck in my mind. But you know, when I was at Apple, for, when I was there for eight years, you know, what, what happens at Apple stays at Apple. And if you're working at Apple, you're not writing a book, basically. But when I retired in 2018, I thought, you know, I'm going to take this up. And that's how the book started. So 
in the book, you, you're very explicit in saying that the definition of charisma is, um, I guess I'd say it's amorphous. It's very difficult to sort of put a, put a pin on it. And yet one of the ways that you describe it is the gift of grace. And when I read you've broken up in the book, your focus on jobs into sort of three points in his life, the early years at Apple, then the years when he was outside of Apple, and then his return to Apple. And after reading the first chapter of Steve founding Apple and what he was like as a person, I was sort of scratching my head saying it didn't sound like Steve Jobs was a very graceful person when he was starting up Apple. Well, um, you know, Willie, I know that you knew him. Um, uh, Steve Jobs has been described by many adjectives, but the one that I've never heard attached to him is nice. I mean, nobody went around saying, boy, that's Steve. He's really a nice guy. Um, he was tough. He himself was mercurial. He was as mer mercurial as the uh, concept of charisma is. Um, but uh, what, um, what, what singles him out, what makes him the touchstone for charisma in modern American business um, is uh, that people would do for him what they wouldn't do for others. That he had a way um, either through uh, through charm, through guile, through brilliance, through cruelty, you tell me, of, of, of inspiring people to do the best work of their lives. And he himself often said that, and there's a lot of truth to it. Now, the, the one thing there is just that as you, I mean, in your book, you profile Jobs, Oprah, Elon Musk, a bunch of other people, but those three in particular, the people who have worked for them have said that they're extremely difficult people to work with. And um, is, is that, is, is being hard to work for part of being a charismatic leader? I mean, there seems to be a little bit of, I mean, it seems almost uh, uh, inconsistent that these brilliant people have to have this side to them that people say that when you worked with them in the office, they were really, really difficult to work with. Um, they are so driven they are so devoted to the product. When I first met uh, Steve Jobs, which was, I met him in 2005 when I was working on my bi biography of Andy Grove. Andy Grove looked at me with those blue eyes and he said, this is a product first company. You've got to understand that. And that, that's really true. So let's, you, you mentioned three people, Jobs, Winfrey, and Musk. Let me stick with Steve for a minute. Um, uh, okay, what, what made him so impossible? Uh, I think that uh, this is amateur psychologizing, but I'm not a professional psychologist, so this is the best you're going to get uh, this morning. Um, uh, um, the product was the vector of love that he felt robbed of because he was um, uh, uh, his, his parents put him up for adoption, and the first couple that adopted him got rid of him because they wanted they decided they wanted a girl instead of a boy. He was always after that love, and the vector for that love were the products. So if you made a great product, you were a hero for Steve. And boy, if you made a mistake, he was brutal. And, uh, you know, that's the way these other people are, too. I mean, Musk, I start my chapter off on Musk by talking about a, a, a visor. And, and he said, you know, a visor in a Tesla. Um, and, and Musk says words to the effect of, it's fish-lipped. In other words, he could see the stitching in it. And he said, every one of those is like a, a needle in my eye. I mean, that's how they experience problems with product. So if you make a mistake with a product, they're unforgiving. If you, um, uh, you know, make it great, you know, you, uh, you're on their good side. But they are, they're demanding and a little crazy sometimes. So in all of this, I mean, as you think about the various characters in your book, um, one of the things that you point out is that all of them at various times had certain tragedies or problems come into their lives. Um, so as you just said, Jobs uh, put up for adoption, if you will, incessantly looking for the love that he didn't get from his, uh, from his biological parents. 
uh, Musk had a very difficult childhood or a difficult childhood with a difficult father, as you highlight in the, in, in, in the book. Um, Oprah Winfrey growing up in Mississippi, um, subject of abject racism, uh, being a woman, um, scrapping every single moment to try and get away from um, both the racism and the lack of opportunity that she was presented at as an African-American woman growing up in Mississippi. Uh, Sam Walton uh, being uh, basically kicked out of the store that he had built to being the best Ben Franklin retailer in the entire state of Arkansas and didn't have a renewal clause in his lease. And the owner said, I'm going to take back the property and give it to my son. So you go through all this and highlight these people have had these sort of moments in time that we all want to say, aha, that's why Sam Walton was such a good retailer, because he got kicked out at that moment or because Oprah was always trying to fight back against racism. But I sort of read it and sort of said, don't all of us deal with challenges in our lives, whether small or big, and that in creating a narrative around these people, we sort of go to that to sort of say, that's what made Steve Jobs so brilliant instead of just saying Steve Jobs was the combination of brilliance, uh, opportunity, and luck that made him take advantage of what was on the table in front of him? Well, first of all, I, I think, you know, your point about Walton losing that lease on that Ben Franklin, I mean, I think he needed Walker and Dunlap to, you know, to advise. Him. <laughs> I would have loved to have done that lease for him. Thank you. That's great. Uh, I appreciate I, I that. Think, uh, Thank you for the plug, Dr. Tedlow. You're welcome. Uh, I would have thrown a little extra business your way. And, uh, yeah. you know, um, he's got 200, I think, I think there are 2.2 million people working for that company now. So, I mean, if every one of those people buy my book, I'll, I'll really be happy. Um, uh, you know, um, we all experience uh, the question is what to do with it and and can you grow and can you not can you can you conquer the fear that it's going to happen to you again and these people did that these people uh, a colleague of mine who was very much at hbs there's no bs like hbs we used to say willie uh very much at the harvard business school when you were there named tom mccraw um used to say that capitalism is future oriented and that's what these people were. They were always, you know, uh, looking at the opportunities that they might grasp without regard or without being constrained by the, by the uh, um, uh, resources that they currently had at their disposal. And that future orientation is what distinguishes Winfrey, Musk, and Jobs from, say, me. You know, I'm an historian. I'm oriented toward the past. So on that, you, you bring up a quote that was said on Oprah's show that stopped her in her tracks. Uh, and the quote was, when you hold on to your history, you do it at the expense of your destiny. Uh, and you talked about how impactful that moment was on her show as it relates to being a forward-focused woman and that resonating with her so much. Talk about that, about how all of these leaders basically compartmentalize what, where they've been and all are maniacally focused on where they're going? The key word is compartmentalized. The key word is the one that you used. Um, so let's go, let's take Oprah Winfrey because it was on her show that this statement was made. When you hold on to your history, you let go of your destiny. If you keep wallowing in the past, um, you, you're never going to create the future. And if you look at her past, a woman born before Brown v. Board of Ed in, um, in a racist environment, a woman who was raped repeatedly from the ages of nine to 14. Um, I, mean, I mean, if she had just focused on that, if she had not been able to somehow put that in the past and think of what she could become rather than the hell that she has been put through, she never would have been the queen of all media, which is what she has become to, to be known, um, to be known as. <clears throat> Musk's uh, uh, childhood in South Africa was horrendous. I mean, in addition to the fact that his father, uh, I, I mean, is not, not the ideal father, put it that way, it would be uh, generous. I mean, he, he was targeted by a, a group of kids at his school. He was beaten up. He was thrown down uh, at one point a, uh, a, a flight of concrete stairs. He was knocked out. He had to have surgery. I mean, this is not what you'd call an ideal childhood. Um, uh, but but they they were not they were not intimidated by the problems they had had in the past, and they didn't change their core belief in themselves. The greatest sale that all these people made 
at the end of the day was selling themselves to themselves. And once they had that belief, you know, there was no stopping them. Now, in addition to that, these are, uh, these are individuals of remarkable talent. I mean, this, these are, are not, they're not average people um, by a long shot. Yeah, on that, just as far as Musk is concerned, I think there were two things that you revealed in the book as it relates to Musk that really surprised me. The first one's that I'd always thought that Elon Musk founded Tesla, and he didn't. Uh, It was founded by three other individuals. Uh, And the second thing was the wealth that he had created prior to founding Tesla. I, I, I didn't, hadn't done any homework on him and didn't realize that one of the companies that he and his brother invested in turned out to be PayPal and that Musk was worth hundreds of millions of dollars when he actually went in to buy Tesla. Yeah, which is very interesting. Uh, PayPal, by the way, um, there, there's a book by an, a Harvard Business School professor named Tom Nicholas called VC, which is a history of venture capital. Um, and, and PayPal is, uh, was the font of a lot of fortunes in Silicon Valley. And one of them was Musk's. And the interesting thing to me about him is that after PayPal, he could have spent, as I say in the book, he could have spent the rest of his life throwing parties for himself. And instead he put that money right back to work and he kept taking risks and he kept going into debt and he kept needing the government to bail him out and to give him subsidies because he had a vision, because charismatic leaders, this is what we can say about them. These are people who stand at the edge of history and bring the future to the present. They are driven to really make a difference, not only in their industry, but in the history of the world. This isn't an exaggeration. And that's what Musk wanted to do. And frankly, I think he's succeeded with Tesla. I think that this is a man who's made a difference. So while we're on the automobile industry, let's, let's back up for two seconds to sort of the beginning of the book when um, you talk about GM and um, Harlow Curtis, who Um, surprisingly to me, was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. One of the things I found very interesting throughout your book, Dr. Tedlow, is that Time Magazine, whether it was Man of the Year or Most Influential Person or whatever, comes up many, many times throughout the the, the history of business um, and all of the protagonists in your book. And yet Time today is, it's not even a shadow of itself. It's it's, it's not really looked at as, um, uh, as a as a journal of record anymore. And it's it's hard to believe that during that period of time, if you were Times Man of the Year as, well, the whole way I knew Steve Jobs was my mother went out to photograph Steve for Man of the Year in 1982. Um, and you may recall that instead of putting Steve on the cover, they put Machine of the Year in 1982 on the cover of Time. But that started a longstanding relationship between my mother and Steve. And I got to know Steve and Laureen over the, what is it, last 40 years. Um, and, uh, but the reason I raise that is just that, I mean, Harlow Curtis was the time man of the year in 1955 when General Motors was at the pinnacle of its presence in American business. Take us back to that and why the company was so much more important than Harlow Curtis. Uh, Let me start just by saying a quick word about time and why I do reference it in, in my book. Uh, you know, I'm, I was born in 1947. And, and Time Magazine in the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, to be chosen as Time Magazine's Man of the Year was um, a huge deal. I mean, Andy Grove one year was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. And, you know, I was, I was actually having dinner with Steve and Laureen when Andy Grove called to, at when he won Man of the Year. And Steve picked it up and said, congratulations. It was, uh, it was quite a moment. But yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something. He was not unhappy about that. And he's been on like 75 magazine covers. But, and by the way, it didn't become person of the year until 1999. You're right, Time Magazine doesn't matter now, but then it did. And um, the interesting thing about 1955 for me, and the reason that I I focus on this fellow Harlow Curtis, is that no one's ever heard of him. And that fact alone is interesting. Uh, He was chosen as the man of the year, not because of the man he was. He was chosen because of the job he held. The job had a man rather than the man having a job. And uh, General Motors was the company of companies in the industry of industries, to use Peter Drucker's phrase. It was, it was the center of the Detroit-Pittsburgh economy around which the American uh, economic activity rotated. Uh, uh, in 1955, they had more than half of the domestic automobile market. Um, in 1950, 85% of the automobiles in the world were produced in this country. Half of them were produced by General Motors. This is the signature product of the 20th century in the same way that the computer, you might say, is the signature product of the 21st century. 
Um, so to be the CEO of this company, um, this is a big deal. Um, but, but nobody would have called him. And the word is not used in the write-up, which I've read more than once. The word charisma is not used. No one would have called him charismatic. They didn't need a charismatic leader then. What they needed was uh, a chief mechanic. They were already on top. Imports in 1955 accounted for 0.71% of the U.S. automobile market. So what they wanted was someone to keep the thing going the way it was. So he was a conservator. He was an administrator. He was, um, uh, he was a company man. Um, he wasn't a man out to change the world. He was a man out to keep the world the way it was. And you note that at that time, the GM board had 36 members on it. Um, being a historian of business, just as a quick aside, not in the book, but just what's the ideal number of board members in your, in your view? Uh, I don't, I, I don't uh, have um, a specific number. I think a lot depends on the business that you're in. And if you're in a lot of different businesses, you might need more board members because you want subject matter experts on that board. But I certainly would say, you know, 10, uh, maybe 11, maybe if you're in a, a you know, a, a very uh, diversified uh, business, maybe 14, but not more. I mean, 38 people can't make a decision. It's, 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 it's not, co it's not true corporate governance in any sense of the word. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a window dressing. So fast forward to, you start in 1955 when GM is at the pinnacle of its influence over the automobile industry worldwide. Uh, and then let's fast forward to when Lee Iacocca steps in to save Chrysler. Um, so Iacocca had been um, unceremoniously kicked out of Ford. So he had that as his, I'm going to be the next CEO of Ford. He got kicked out and ends up being pulled into Chrysler. What was it about Iacocca and his charisma that made him successful at turning Chrysler around? First of all, it's another example of something that you started off by uh, denominating, which is uh, being fired from Ford was a terrible blow to this guy. I mean, he had, he had made his whole career in Ford. He was the president. He was sure he was going to succeed Henry Ford II. He was really fired, you know, without cause. As Henry Ford II said, sometimes you just don't like a person. Um, not much reason to fire some guy who's making you a lot of money. Uh, he went to Chrysler. Uh, this was a company that was circling the drain. It wasn't going anywhere. Uh, it was the third uh, of the, the then big three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler. He didn't even know where it was when he got the job. I mean, he needed help finding it. Um, nobody at Ford looked at Chrysler. Everybody looked at, at GM. Um, and uh, he was chosen, and he didn't, he himself, in his book, it's quite an interesting book, uh, says, you know, if he had known that the job was going to be as hard as it was, he's not sure he would have taken it. But he did turn it around, and um, uh, he deserves a great deal of credit for that. It was turning around any company is very difficult. Automobile companies are complicated, and uh, he managed that, and he deserves a lot of credit for it. To those of us who were alive and watching television at that time, uh, we remember the Iacocca ads where he came out and became really the face of the brand. And he had that line, if you can find a better car, buy it. Um, was that the first time that a major US CEO had sort of become the face of the company and did a nationwide ad campaign? And do you think that that had something to do with the transformation from, if you will, CEOs being inside of a company, but the company was the face of the company to the CEO becoming the face and being more outward facing and more charismatic? I agree with what you're saying. I, uh, I think it was a turning point. I think it was, it was very important. He himself said that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned that I may be remembered only for, you know, these commercials. Um, but any of us who remember, those commercials were, were very, I mean, it's, it's emblematic of the change from phase one, which runs basically from 1955 to 1975, to phase two, which runs basically from 1975 to 1995, that Lee Iacocca is in phase two. Because in phase one, if Harlow Curtis had done what Lee Iacocca did, he would have been fired. Um, but for Lee Iacocca to be in your face, and I encourage any uh, of your uh, viewers to go on, on YouTube and just take a look at some of those commercials. I mean, they're completely in your face. They are, uh, at the end, the, with the tagline, and I think he came up with this himself, 
Kenyon and Eckhart was the uh, advertising agency that convinced them to do this. If you can buy, if you can find a better car, buy it. And that's the kind of challenge, uh, the kind of, you know, no holds barred uh, belief in the product. Because if you don't believe in it, who the hell is going to? Um, that Iacocca epitomized. Those commercials made him famous. And um, is he the first CEO who's ever done that? I believe um, uh, historians are always um, you know, reluctant to say the first because then somebody comes up with something earlier and you right. look an idiot. Um, I think he's the first one certainly to do it on television with that kind of, of uh, um, with those with buys of those size, in other words, that many commercials. Um, oddly enough, or interestingly enough, Walter P. Chrysler himself in 1932 had magazine ads that said, look at all three. In other words, don't just look at Ford, don't just look at Chevy, look at Plymouth, which was his entry into the low price. So it's been done before, but never with the kind of impact that Iacocca did. And, and you're, you're quite right. Um, after that, the, the CEO begins to become the face of the corporation. It begins to become a name that people know. Everybody knew Iacocca's name. So um, before we shift out of that period, because I, I next want to go to Sam Walton, who started a company during that period of time, and talk about Walton for a moment. But the, it, during this same time, the iconic Apple ad came out uh, in introducing the Mac. And uh, uh, during the Super Bowl um, with 1984 as the backdrop, and Shiat Day produced that ad. That ad has a lot to do with defining Steve's character uh, and and his charisma. Talk for a moment, Dr. Tedlow, about just the the how that ad got created, and then how hard it was for Steve to convince his board that they ought to run it during the Super Bowl. Um. That's the apparently um, experts believe that that's the greatest ad ever run. Um, it was utterly shocking. Um, it's hard to know because different sources give you different numbers, and I I uh, I, I wasn't there. But um, some people believe it cost seven hundred fifty thousand dollars just to produce it. It was produced by Ridley Scott, who made Blade Runner and a lot of other famous movies, and I think he's now Sir Ridley Scott. He was knighted. <clears throat> The commercial itself is like a movie. It's only a minute long, but when you go through it, I mean, you feel like you've lived a whole lifetime. Yeah. And it was a completely, what Steve said was, I want a thunderclap. And um, uh, John Scully, who was at the company at the time, the board of directors, everybody was against it because it, was, it did nothing that a traditional commercial is supposed to do. It didn't tell you anything about the product. It didn't tell you what it did. There were no speeds and feeds. There were no technical uh, 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 observations about it. It just said, you know, we're going to change the world. And um, uh, and uh, what Steve said was, you know, I want something that's going to make people think different, which was one of his, you know, sayings. And this really did. This commercial, which some people complained about because it was so expensive, this, that, and the other, was covered on all three networks in those days. It was ABC, CBS, and NBC. So it was covered a lot as news. And as a matter of fact, when the, uh, when, the, um, when the ball game came back on, it was the Oakland Raiders who beat whoever the hell they beat in a very boring Super Bowl. John Madden, who I think was the, um, uh, one of the color commentator at the time, I think it was John Madden, Pat Summerall. John Madden said, what was that? Right. You know, no, I mean, this thing got an amazing amount of publicity and it was further proof that if you think different, good things might happen. So in the period of malaise or, or, or American retrenchment of 75 to 95, um, Sam Walton takes Walmart to all kinds of success. One of the things you underscore is that Walton was a fantastic athlete. Uh, he didn't play sports at the University of Missouri, but as a high school athlete, he was captain of the football team. He played basketball and wasn't very tall, but loved being the point guard. Um, and I was just curious, has athletics underscored many of the great leaders that you have studied as one of the kind of background qualifiers to being a great leader? Or is it just in this situation with Walton, just one of those things that stood out on what made Walton such a competitive person? Well, it certainly stood out with Walton. So let's just start there. Um, uh, he was incredibly competitive. 
he he never played in a losing football game, Willie. Uh, and by the way, I can say the same thing of myself, uh, but I did it differently from the way he did it. Um, he was a guard uh, on the basketball team, even though he was only 5'9". He thought he was destined to win. I mean, he looked at himself once again. He made this sale of himself to himself. I don't think necessarily that... Um, you know, great business leaders are great athletes. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But athletics can instill in you a sense of competition and a sense that, 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 that you can come from behind, that, that it isn't over till it's over, as Yogi Berra, I think, said. Um, uh, and that um, you, you, you can pull a victory out of the jaws of defeat. Um, uh, there, there, there is a, a certain toughness and a certain competitiveness that athletics, athletic activity does engender and uh, help to grow. Certainly that was true with Walton. It's, it's not true with all of them. So I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily uh, vital, but it can be helpful. There was a line that you wrote in the book, Dr. Tedlow, that I underscored, circled, dog-eared, and I've got it here, which is when talking about Sam Walton, and the way that he made his people heroes and they made him a hero. You write, there must be a mutuality of affect. Talk about that for a moment. I, I, when you wrote that, I just, I, to, to bring it down to that, this, this mutuality of affect, I thought was such a wonderful way of describing what Walton did. Uh, I think that's true. Um, I think what you have to understand about Walton so, I mean, think of your, um, your own education. So you went to St. Lawrence University, then you went to the Harvard Business School. And, and think about the teacher that you liked the most. I guarantee you that that teacher, in some sense, loved students. Um, and I think that's true for public presenters. If you love your audience, they'll love you. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, you know, that's really true. He made heroes out of his people. He he underpromised and overdelivered. He gave them more than they thought they ever would, that they ever would get. Um, and uh, if you read people's reflections on Walton, he they keep saying, you know, he he just loved them. Um, and he also felt, and this is very interesting, that he could learn from them. He felt you could learn from anybody. And so nobody, uh, you know, no any when he would walk into a store. I mean, the whole story of the people greeter, uh, I don't know if you remember this yeah. story. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. Let me go through it real quickly. Um, uh, Walton was always in stores. I mean, he was, he was a subject matter expert. He knew more about retail in the 1960s and 70s and 80s than anybody else in, in the world. And so he goes into one store, I think it's in Louisiana, and there's an, an elderly gentleman at the, uh, at the entrance who says, you know, welcome to Walmart. If there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know. He's startled. This was not an order from him. This was something that the store manager came up with for two reasons. One, to make people feel good when they came into the Walmart. And two, this store manager was, I think it was in Crowley, Louisiana, but maybe it wasn't. Um, um, this store manager um, had noticed that some of his merchandise was, you know, growing feet and leaving the store and uh, shrinkage is, is death for a discount retailer because your margins are razor thin. So by having a people greeter there, um, uh, you knew there was someone sort of watching. And, and without, without any uniform, you know, without threatening, but watching. And uh, he learned from that. He learned about uh, supply chain management from his people. And he was, there was an omnipresence of the guy. He was everywhere. And he kept learning and, and kept growing. And so uh, it's, a, it's a spectacular story. You mentioned that he was fantastic at under-promising and over-delivering. There's an anecdote of a conversation that he had with a truck driver for Walmart in 1972. You want to tell that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the truck driver whose name I think was Jim Clark, or maybe it wasn't, but I think that was. Uh, Walton said to him, if you stay with me for 20 years, you'll have a pen uh, uh, pension or profit sharing worth $100,000. And this guy, this truck driver who's worried about only, you know, his making his next payment on his washing machine said, you know, this is ridiculous. I'll never, I'll never, uh, Jim Clark or whatever his name was, uh, will never have a um, hundred thousand dollars. Well, 
1992, we had $707,000. It's the perfect example of under-promising and over-delivering, and that's what these characters do, and that is pretty consistent. Yeah. So during the same period of time, Mary Kay, who had gone through her own struggles, um, got divorced and got remarried, her husband died, and it, I think the age was 67 that she asked her sons to come join her to take Mary Kay forward. I, I may be putting her a little bit later than she was at that time, but she was not a spring chicken when she decided to take Mary Kay on and, and grow it. And one of the really impactful quotes that you say from Mary Kay was, to me, p &L stood for more than profit and loss. It stood for people and love. That's Mary Kay. And uh, she, also, she also said, every time I encounter someone, I imagine that person with a big sign that says, make me feel important. And she was able to do that. She was able, like Walton, to make stars out of her people. And um, uh, it, it was that, that pleasure that she got in that and her special ability to do that is one reason that she created something out of nothing. And as you point out, I mean, um, Mary Kay uh, Cosmetics was founded, my recollection is on September 13th, 1963. On September, on August 13th, 1963, her second husband, a man named Hollenbeck, he's going to do the numbers. He's going to do the profit and loss. She does the people in love. That's the division of labor. So as she says, I'm having breakfast with him. I'm listening to him with half an ear. And he drops dead of a heart attack a month before the company is going to be launched. All her advisors tell her, you don't know anything about this industry. You've never been in it. Um, uh, you, you've got to pull the plug on this company. Her sons, on the other hand, especially the one in Houston, said, Mom, I think that you could do anything. And he gives her his bank book. And then his her second son, Rich, uh, Richard, uh, joins the company. And they build it from nothing. And um, um, and they, once again, th these were this was more than a company. It was a crusade. They were missionaries. She was convinced that as a woman, her special talent was training salespeople. She was convinced that she was being underpaid, undersold, under-respected. And she was convinced that she could build a company that that wasn't true of four women. And the result was Mary Kay. So she called her um, employees and they were all independent contractors. So they actually weren't employees of hers. But nonetheless, she called her employees beauty consultants and Sam Walton called uh, Walmart employees associates. Uh, I, when, I, when I read you talking about that, it, it, it means a lot to their character and to the way that they looked at their colleagues of not thinking them as, of as, as employees, but as beauty consultants and associates. We're part of the team. That's the idea. You're not just selling, um, you're, you're serving. Um, and, uh, and everything that you do builds us as a team. It's one for all, all for one. If you uh, take a look, Sam Walton was uh, awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1992 by George H.W. Bush. And he was dying at, 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 at that time. Uh, he had just a couple of weeks to live. He knew it. Uh, and he gave what was his last public speech. And in that speech at that time, Walmart had 380,000 employees, far more now, of course. He said, we're all working together. And that's the secret. And I hope we can keep it that way. And that is the secret. Um, if, you can, if you can somehow align incentives and get everybody in, you know, rowing in the same direction, uh, the boat's going to go a lot faster. You mentioned Walton dying in 1992. He had published his book, Made in America, I believe in 89 or 90. No, it was 92. It was, a matter of fact, it, it was, was 92. It was the year. It was, that year. Died. it was published after he died. Yeah. And, and in it, one of the things that I just can't believe didn't come out in Donald Trump running for the presidency twice, um, and winning once, obviously, um, is that in his book, he basically says all things not Trump. So we got to remember, this is back in 1992. But Sam Walton sat there and said, everything that we do at Walmart is sort of the antithesis of what Donald Trump stands for in the Trump organization. And I just, I was uh, amazed that I didn't learn about that until your book, and how Sam Walton looked at Donald Trump and said, we're everything but what that guy stands for. That's true. Um, and he, you know, Walton was for real. 
I mean, Walden was a man who would get down on his hands and knees, look under a shelf and ask, how do you know how fast this merchandise is moving? You know, can you imagine Donald Trump as a business person doing anything like that? Um, I, um, I mean, in the 1990s, apparently Trump was a, a, a staple of New York tabloids. I never read him and I didn't pay much attention to him because I thought, you know, this is just another publicity hound. And, um, you know, to, to my regret, you know, I underestimated him. Um, but Walton, and we're not talking about the Walmart of today now, we're talking about the Walmart of the 1980s, 1990s. Wal Walton was a man of integrity and he was a man, and I've used this phrase before, but it's very important. He was a man of deep subject matter expertise. He really knew that business. And he knew the people who could make it rise uh, in the way he wanted it to. And he, 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 he knew how to honor people. Um, there's one remark in the book um, about how one uh, associate uh, says, uh, she says, I got my 15 year pin from Sam personally and how much that meant to her. Um, um, and there is this, this omnipresence about the man. I remember the, early, the earliest cases at the Harvard Business School about Walmart. I remember the teaching notes, Willie. One of them said, can they continue to run this company from Bentonville? I mean, that's a Northeastern prejudice, if you will. Well, they can. I mean, they have a fleet of airplanes that go out all the time and, and you're supposed to come back and, and come back with ideas that pay for your trip. Yeah. So in th this same period of time, Steve is on what I would call his sabbatical from Apple. He's, he's, he's been kicked out. Um, he started Next. Um, he'd invested in Pixar. Um, talk about how important that period of time was to setting Steve up for the incredible success he had when he came back to Apple. That, those 12 years are critical. Um, because it's during those 12 years that he learns um, how to harness his incredible native talent to uh, launch a company like Apple into the stratosphere. He learns because he tried with Next to create the next big thing, and it was a next, it was a flop. I mean, as a computer, it was, uh, to quote Bill Gates, you know, write for it, I'll piss on it. I mean, um, uh, but he did have some software that came from there, uh, thanks to Avi Tavanian and some others. Next step, um, uh, that's what allowed him to get back into Apple. Um, but it was, it was struggling with Next, realizing that his dream wasn't going to become uh, reality, and then making what has been called this side bet on Pixar. And it was just because he saw something in Pixar that was remarkable, that was new, Charisma is about bringing about the new, and here's this computerized animation, and, and he sinks a fortune of his own money in it, much more so than any venture capital would, than he, no venture capitalist was, would have stuck with this company as long as Jobs did. But he believed in it, and um, he was lucky in that he found in a, a man named Ed Catmull, C-A-T-M-U-L-L, -L, um, a man who knew how to deal with him. Who, who understood his special genius and who understood that he could be difficult, but who, who was willing to accept the difficulty for the genius. And he saw in Catmull a guy who, would, who, who had the same attitude toward his product that Jobs had toward his product. He wouldn't settle for anything south of, per, of perfection. And to see Catmull get his people together, to see him show patience when it was necessary, to see him go back and fix something that was that nobody else in the world would notice, but that he knew this is something that inspired Steve. And in addition to those, in addition to that, in those 12 years, Steve Jobs finally found love. And he found it in Lorene uh, uh, Powell Jobs, who herself, by the way, had had a very difficult childhood uh, in New Jersey, Westfield, I think is where she grew up. Um, she was at the Stanford Business School when they met. And um, he wound up, uh, you know, with a, with, with a beautiful family and, uh, and a wife who loved him and, um, and who understood him and who knew how to manage him. Um, and you put all that together and, and this guy's ready to be launched by 1997. And so when he comes back into Apple, you highlight that those first three years 
It wasn't as if Steve showed back up and snapped his fingers and things just started to happen. He had a very significant rationalization process that he had to manage through. Um, and he also started a number of projects that he had more patience for than he had ever displayed previously when Apple was trying to develop the Mac and a bunch of other products back in the early 1980s. To talk about that, you, you, you talk about Catmull as well as Lorene being big influences on giving him a different approach to managing Apple when he comes back for the second time around. But I do think that there's an important point here, Dr. Tedlow, which is just that it wasn't like he showed up, snapped his fingers, and the iPhone emerged. Uh, it was a lot of general management to get the firm back to the point where then the creativity that was Steve's genius could come to bear. Um, okay. First of all, you're right. He comes back 12 years less one day after he was fired. And uh, he doesn't know, Willie, whether the company, whether he himself can breathe life into this company, which was, uh, depending on whom he's talked to, two months or six weeks or one month away from not being able to make payroll. I mean, they were in a lot of trouble. I mean, if you think about the big names of the 1990s, they were Compaq, they were Gateway, they were, you know, there were a million companies that now no one remembers. But those were the companies that were uh, moving the, the needle on the meter of life. And he comes back and he's so unsure of whether he should take the job or not, that at one point at, at two o'clock in the morning, he calls Andy Grove and says, you know, what should I do about Apple? Here are the pros and cons. And Grove said, um, pardon my language, but this is what he said. Um, uh, Steve, I don't give a shit about Apple. Just make up your mind. Uh, Intel should have cared about Apple, actually. Um, but uh, he comes back as the interim CEO because he's not sure he's going to be able to turn this ship around. And it's that interim, the I in the interim, which is the I in the iPod, the I in iTunes, the I in the iPad, iPhone. So um, most people don't know that. So um, I, I, let me just say to your viewers, if you didn't know that, you can now say that I learned one thing from the Willie Walker <laughs> Richard Tunnel podcast which is where the I came from. Uh, anyway, um, uh, it took a long time. I mean, uh, as you may remember, 2000, 2001 especially, was the dot-com bust. It was bad times for tech companies. Um, top executives were coming to Steve and saying, we're doing everything right, we're not getting anywhere. And he said, just wait. Um, uh, we are doing everything right, and that will pay off. And that kind of uh, uh, stick to itiveness, that kind of not needing to turn the page immediately, that kind of not needing a thunderclap, but of playing the long game. That was the result of the 12 years that he had between 85 and 97. And then when, when the iTunes store and the iPod came along, then they knew that they had something that was uh, really uh, special. And you, I have a clip that I can tee up, but since I want to keep talking to you, I'm not going to spend two minutes having Steve tell it. I think you can tell it just as well. But when they, when they announced the iPhone and he comes out and he says, we're going to have a widescreen iPod, we're going to have a phone, and we're going to have an internet connected device and sits there and everyone's sitting there saying, we got three products coming out, three products coming out. And then he spins the, he spins the icons over and over and says, I think you see where we're going. And then he says, here's the iPhone. You, you go into great detail there of how that in that one two minute clip sort of pulls all of Steve Jobs's charisma together. It shows you his vision. It shows you his presence on stage. And it shows you the genius of him looking forward to where markets are going and not where they have been. Boy, that you put it perfectly. Um, it's where they're going, not where they have been. Where have they been? They've been with the BlackBerry, which uh, your viewers may remember, you know, had a plastic um, uh, keyboard. And uh, so here's my iPhone. Um, it doesn't have a plastic keyboard. I mean, he did this, nobody thought, you know, they, they thought it wasn't going to be a useful in business because it, it wasn't going to be an email device because it didn't have a keyboard. Well, he did it with software. And the Gorilla Glass story is a fantastic yeah. story. Amazing story. <laughs> now, um, as with so many things, you, look, you knew him. So as with so many things with Steve Jobs, yeah, I, I don't know if it's true or if it isn't true, but I can say this, if, if it isn't true, it ought to be. So here's the story. He's walking around Palo Alto with a, a mock-up of the original iPhone 
it's plastic. His keys scratch it. That's unacceptable. I mean, that's, you know, uh, that's a needle in your eye. That's got to go. So he says, we need glass. So he, he calls um, the, 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 a guy named Weeks, Wendell Weeks, who's running Corning. All right, Corning has been making glass since 1851. And he can't get through to, to Weeks. And, you know, uh, the, the admin or the whatever says, look, I will write Mr. Weeks a note saying that you want to talk to him. And he said, no, no, I'm Steve Jobs. I want to talk to Wendell Weeks. And so he hangs up, throws a fit, and gets in touch with the guy who said to told him to get in touch with Corning and said, I'm having to deal with typical East Coast bullshit. Those were his words. So <coughs> Weeks decides to call Jobs. And what he gets from the Apple operator is, fax your desire to speak to Steve. Give me the reason. And, and, and so, you know, that's how you had to deal with Steve. I mean, if he pushes you, you've got to push back harder. So finally, Weeks and Jobs get together. And, and by chance, this is a long story I won't go into, but by chance, Corning had developed something called Gorilla Glass, which was exactly what the iPhone needed. And Steve said, fine, I'll take as much and I, I want it as quickly as you can get it. And he said, we don't make it. You know, we wanted to sell it to the automobile industry because glass and cars, when it gets, they get into an accident, crack. He, nonsense, I don't want it, uh, said the automobile industry. So we don't make it. So we can't possibly make the goals that you have in order to produce Gorilla Glass for your phone. And Steve said, sure you can. You know, get your mind around it. You can do it. And by the way, that's what Mary Kay Ash's mother always said to Mary Kay, you can do it. And that's what the charismatic leader says, you can do it. Weeks says, no, we can't. Steve said, sure you can, get your mind. Weeks actually succeed. And the original iPhone did have glass rather than plastic. And uh, when it premiered in 2007, which was a key moment, because not only, as, as you point out, not only does that um, clip, um, uh, uh, encapsulate his uh, charisma, but um, that's the moment that Apple becomes a, co a, 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 uh, a company that makes this, and this becomes more important than the computer, and they change their name in 2007 from Apple Computer to Apple because it, it becomes a technology device company. And you worked with Apple for a good part of the last decade. Yes, eight um, years. I think many of us who watched what Steve did at Apple um, had little confidence that Apple could continue on being as innovative a uh, company without Steve's leadership and vision at the top of it. And I just, I, I think about it and, and you watch that transformation happen. Um, what, what, what was key that was there when Steve was still around that has allowed Apple to continue forward in the fashion that it has? Um, Steve's greatest creation was not, you know, the iPhone, the iPod, the iPad, what have you. It was Apple. It was a company that believed in uh, focus and simplify. I mean, those words you heard all the time. You, you saw simplify, simplify, simplify. When I was teaching at the Harvard Business School, we taught about how to manage complexity. Steve taught about how to manage simplicity. That's better. Um, uh, he understood the nature of technology in the following way. He said, technology alone is not enough. It must be technology married to the humanities, married to the liberal arts that yield the results that make our hearts sing. Those are his words. And that's the kind of insight that is baked into that company the kind of, uh, of, of drive for excellence, the kind of teamwork, the fact that a company that now I haven't looked today, but is worth about two and a half trillion dollars, it's a lot more money than I have, um, uh, uh, has a single P&L. Uh, I mean, uh, how many, you know, at, at the Harvard Business School, we taught multi-divisional enterprise. They've got a single P&L. They simplify, simplify, simplify. Um, there are only a, a small set of decisions that have to go all the way up to Tim Cook. The, te the, the company is built around teams and the teams that work are simply fantastic. To me, the most impressive, certainly when I was there, was the camera team. I mean, you know, imagine putting a, a camera in and mass producing it in this thing. 
and, and these pictures are gorgeous. I have no idea how many uh, pictures are uploaded to the cloud in the course of a day, but my guess is there are a lot. Um, and one of the interesting things, by the way, about that introduction to the iPhone is that Steve Jobs himself didn't know what they had with the camera. Uh, I don't know this for a fact, but I bet you it's one of the top five apps on the phone. And um, uh, it, when he introduced it, he said, we have a two megapixel rear facing camera on this thing. And he hardly mentioned it. Now it takes great photos and, um, and it, be, it, has, it has become a platform. And, um, and he enabled that to happen. So <clears throat> what Tim Cook, who by the way, is quite a remarkable man himself, what Tim Cook has done is he's built on that and he's muscle built that organization and it's a very impressive company. So as I, as I think about um, Steve's influence on Apple and the, the, if you will, the maturation of his personality over time, um, I think about Elon Musk, who you also focus on, and I think about what you highlight of Musk's genius, uh, he, and at the same time, the revolving door of executives that is widely watched by shorters of Tesla stock uh, as it relates to chief technologist, chief financial officer, chief legal officer, who seem to show up to work for Elon, spend about four or five months, say, I cannot work in this environment and walk back out the door. Um, and it's very clear. You also highlight Musk in his tweets on the SEC fine of $10 million, which obviously is a drop in the bucket for Elon Musk to pay a $10 million fine and step down as chairman of the board. He's still CEO. He still controls it. And he's still as, uh, if you will, provocative as ever in his tweets. Um, all that says to me that Tesla is, is sort of an accident waiting to happen, thinking about it through a sort of traditional mindset of how do you create teams to create products, all the things that Steve left at Apple that has allowed it to carry on for over a decade, a decade literally last week without him uh, still alive. What's your take on Tesla and Musk and all that he's creating? Because to those of us who've watched it, A, it doesn't make that much sense. But then at the same time, I also saw that rocket come down, land in the ocean exactly where it needed to, looked at the capsule, and you talked about Musk looking at the, the fish-lipped edges of that visor. Everything inside of that capsule made what NASA puts up into the, into the space look like, well, it was built in the 1950s and not in 2020. So what's your take on Musk and the sustainability of what he's created? Um, first of all, let me say that there are things in my life that I regret. But one thing that I don't regret is not shorting Tesla. Um, uh, that would have turned out to be a mistake. Um, Makes two yeah. of us. Yeah. I, I don't understand. Building a car is hard. I don't understand, given the revolving door that that company is, how he manages. But the fact is that he does. And I think the reason that he is able to do it is that the vision is so powerful. Once again, if you look at the Model 3 unveil, He's talking about not just building another car. And by the way, this is the first successful domestic automobile startup since 1925, since Chrysler was formed. Um, he's not talking about just building another car. He's talking about saving the species because the, the human species is in fact in danger because of climate change and pollution. And, and the, in that introduction, he says, this is carbon. He said the last time this, there was this much carbon in the atmosphere, primates began walking upright. So he's able to get people to come in, even though they know what they're getting into. He's able to get quality people to come in because there is a vision that we're going to change the world. We're not just, we're not going to do something trivial here. You know, we're going to matter. And he's able to endow that in the same way that Mary Kay was able to endow that uh, with, I'm going to create a world that women um, uh, can uh, be treated right in, in the same way that Jobs was able to endow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make your technology beautiful, in the same way that Oprah Winfrey was able to get out of people with whom she interviewed something really special that other people haven't been able to do, that's charisma. And, uh, and, and let me tell you something, Elon Musk has it. So as you think about all of these protagonists, and you just ran through a number of the various qualities, to those of us listening today, um, 
all of us want to take away from this. What's the thing that I need to work on? What's the piece of charismatic leadership uh, that I, as either a CEO or the head of a division or someone who is aspiring to run a division or run a company someday, ought to really kind of hone a particular skill or set of skills that you have seen as you've studied these incredible business leaders? Um, what am I passionate about? That's the question you've got to answer. Because if you can't, and if, if, if you can't answer it for yourself, you're not going to be able to answer it for your people. <clears throat> and you don't have to be a CEO. I mean, when I was at Apple, which was from 2010 to 2018, and I got to know the camera team, which were, these are wonderful people. They, they, you know, they have a little mantra. Apple doesn't have a credo like Johnson & Johnson did. Perhaps you remember the Tylenol cases from when you were oh, yeah. uh, back at HBS. I wrote those, by the way. Um, uh, uh, Iconic cases that are still taught. I know. Uh, I still get a small uh, residual as a result of that. Uh, anyway, um, uh, that camera team, you, you know, what are they in the business of doing? More people taking better pictures more of the time. So putting these cameras in these phones and mass producing them is as complicated as the brain. But it comes down to more people taking better pictures more of the time. And if you can, if you can encapsulate the value proposition that you are, are selling to yourself, to your people, to your investors, to your customers, that's, that's the way toward charisma. Um, I'm not saying that everybody can become Steve Jobs. I certainly couldn't. It's not, you know, I mean, there is a special magic. But, but I don't think that charisma is digital. I don't think it's a question of either you have it or you don't. I think you can learn it. Are you passionate about your work and why? That can be communicated. This business, uh, integrity can com be communicated. Uh, fairness can be communicated. Uh, and and uh, love of your work and love of the people who make you better. That's the, the combination, the, the, the two-way street of charisma. It's been said that if you run down the street naked and um, uh, saying that you alone can save the world, and a whole bunch of people are running down the street after you saying, you're right, you know, you're, you're, uh, my money's on you, that makes you charismatic. If you run down the street naked saying that you alone can save the world and there's nobody else running after you, you're a nut. You know, so, I mean, you've got to be able to sell it, to sell the vision, no matter how strange or how, how outlandish it seems. And think about it. I mean, Apple said, we're going to reinvent the phone in 2007. The phone was invented in 1876. Musk said, I'm going to reinvent the motive power for um, uh, uh, automobiles. Automobiles have been around since the 19th century. Uh, um, uh, Oprah Winfrey becomes the queen of all media, despite the fact that African Americans have had a very hard time, especially on television uh, in, in the early years. She broke through. Why is that? Um, these are the questions that can't be answered until they're asked. And, and they need to be asked in order to move forward toward, I think, toward true leadership. Well, you both ask the question and give us a lot to both um, think about and to learn about in your book, uh, The Emergence of Charismatic Business Leadership. I'm super grateful of you spending an hour with me, Dr. Tedlow. It's been a, a real pleasure. Um, to any of you who don't have the book, uh, I strongly recommend it. I love reading it, uh, as you can tell. And uh, again, um, thank you, Dr. Tedlow, for joining me. And I hope everyone has a fantastic day. We will be back next week with Ivy Zellman uh, to talk about her new book, um, of how she became one of the breakthrough analysts on Wall Street as a female. And so as we talk about leadership, charisma, and how people are path uh, blazing a new path, Ivy Zellman is a wonderful person to listen to. So I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Dr. Tedlow, thanks again. Willie, it's been a delight. Thank you so very much for having me on your show. Take care. Bye.